Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel according to John. And I'm going to be reading John chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. This is after the resurrection on this Easter Sunday of Eastertide. Later, Jesus himself appeared again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. This is how it happened. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter told them, I'm going fishing. And they said, well, we'll go with you. And they set out in a boat, but throughout the night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. Jesus called to them, children, have you caught anything to eat? And they answered him, no. And he said, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And so they did. And there were so many fish that they couldn't haul in the net. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he wrapped his coat around himself because he was naked, and he jumped into the water. And the other disciples followed in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they weren't far from the shore, only about 100 yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. And Simon got up and pulled the net to shore, and it was full of large fish, 153 of them. And yet the net hadn't torn, even with so many fish. Jesus said to them, come, eat, have some breakfast. But none of the disciples could bring themselves to ask, who are you? Because they knew, they knew that it was the Lord. Jesus came, took bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they finished eating, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Simon replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Jesus asked him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Simon replied, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. He asked a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was sad that Jesus had asked him a third time. He replied, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I assure you that when you were younger, you tied your own belt and walked around wherever you wanted. When you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and another will tie your belt and lead you where you don't want to go. He said this to show that the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. After saying this, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God for God's holy word. Amen. This is the third Sunday of Easter. Bonus points if you caught the typo on the front of the bulletin. Easter tide is seven weeks long, 50 days. It culminates in Pentecost. And over these next few weeks, we will see miracles, we will see signs, we will see Jesus ascend to the heavens. And here we are on the lake shore. One of the things that I love about this passage in John 21 
is that the disciples get back to work. They get back into the boat. Finally, having come out of the locked room, and go back to the lives that they knew before Christ. The livelihood by which they knew to support themselves. Still probably, if I had to suspect, looking back over their shoulder to see if anybody was coming for them. Especially Peter, who denied Jesus three times that day. But here we are in the boat with the disciples, and they say, oh, we're going to get back to work. We're going to go fishing. We're going to find some food to eat. And they go, and they cast their nets, and they got nothing. Nothing. They did exactly what they used to do. They tried everything they knew, and nothing. And then Jesus says from the shore, hey, y'all, try the other side of the boat. And they do it, and they catch fish. What I love about this particular passage is it reminds me that when we do the exact same thing that we've always done, and we expect different results, what is that? The definition of insanity. What I love about this passage is that Jesus says, hey, y'all, try it different. And they catch fish. What I love about this passage is that Jesus is on the shore saying, y'all haven't caught nothing. Try it different. Don't try it the same. Don't try it harder. Try it different. And then he comes And he invites them to come and join him on the beach for a meal that sounds very familiar to us. Where Christ takes and breaks and blesses bread and shares it. As if to remind us that it is in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of a holy meal that we meet Christ and we meet each other. Come, have breakfast. You got to be hungry after staying up all night and catching nothing. I know that the people in this congregation and online who are fishing people know exactly what it's like to have stayed up all night and caught nothing. How exhausting and demoralizing it can feel. Amen. But what I really, really, really love about this passage is this intersection and engagement between Peter and Jesus. After that holy meal, after which everyone realizes, oh my gosh, it's our risen Lord. We are left with Peter and Jesus. Sitting there, sharing a meal, having conversation. And when they have finished eating, Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? How many of you all know that there are four types of love in the ancient Greek? Four types of words that can be used. My husband is like, I do! So there are four types of words in the ancient Greek that can be translated into love. This is why sometimes reading the texts in our English language shortens our understanding of the text. Because we're not reading it in the ancient Greek. Fortunately, I am not John Wesley, and so I don't require everyone to learn ancient Greek and biblical Hebrew. But John Wesley thought that everybody who follows a follower of Jesus should learn the biblical languages. 
He thought a lot of things. Praise Jesus for it's the 21st century. Amen. What? No? Praise Jesus. It's the 21st century. Amen. Amen. A lot of things have changed. Thank you, Lord. Hey, I can, well, John Wesley had women preachers too, but that's a whole other conversation for another day. But in the ancient Greek, there are four types of love. There is eros. Eros, romantic love, life love, fullness love. The love between a husband and a wife, hey. The love between us and creation, I think, is an eros love, that passion Right? Whether it's for another person, or for the living, or maybe even for the fish, right? That eros kind of love. Then there is storge love, the love that we have for our parents and our children, that kind of familial kind of love. The love that we have for our grandparents and our great-grandparents and our grandkids and our great-grandkids. That love of family. Then there's also Philadelphia, right? Brotherly love. Philae love. Love between best friends. And then there's agape love the fullest, most complete love of all. Love that is sacrificial. Love that takes pleasure in serving. Love that loves the beloved and holding all else. Willing to abandon everything for the sake of love. Love, you see, agape love is that glue that holds all the other loves together. It's the love that makes filio love kind of come out, that brotherly love of the soul, right? That affection that we have, right? It's the love that, agape is the kind of love that undergirds all of the love that we have for our children and our parents and our grandchildren. It's the love that we have for our spouses, right? Agape is the root love, the deepest love the truest love. It's that love that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 13, right? That bears all things, endures all things, believes all things, that never gives up and never fails. That is agape. That is not rude but it, and does not boast, but it is patient and kind. Agape. Right? And so, so knowing that there are these four types of loves, I want to let you know that in this particular passage, what I think is so cool about this and where our English reading doesn't quite, it misses the mark, is that Jesus is sitting here talking to Simon Peter and saying, Simon Peter, do you agape me more than these things? Do you agape me? Do you, will you sacrifice for me? Will you love the deepest kind of love me? Will you take pleasure in serving me? Will you, above all else, love me with your whole being? Will you put the interest, my interests, above your own? Will you put my reign above your own, my kingdom above your own? Will you bear at all costs this love that you have for me? And Peter says to the Lord, Lord, I filio you, man. I love you like a brother. I have strong and deep affection for you. But remember, Peter denied Jesus three times that day. And Jesus says to him again, Simon, do you agape me? Do you love me with your whole being? And Jesus, and Simon says to Jesus, Lord, you know I filio you. You know I have deep affection. We are brothers. You are my Lord. You know I love you. 
And Jesus finally says in that third asking, the Greek changes from agape to filio. And saddened, Peter says, Lord, you know all these things. You see, Jesus was calling Peter forth to a deeper kind of love. A love that sacrifices, a love that bears all and endures all and believes all. And Peter couldn't get it. Because we can't give what we don't have. And what I love about this particular scripture, it's not to throw Peter under the bus. It's not to say which boat is the right side of the boat. I love this because Peter is a human being in this scripture. I love this. Because Peter, Peter is the rock on which the church is built. Amen? And yet Peter is not there yet. Peter does not have agape yet. Peter knows he's not giving the answers that Jesus, is, Jesus wants and is clearly saddened by it. He knows that he doesn't, he can't give what he doesn't have, and he knows that Jesus meets him where he is and asks them then to care for the flock, to tend and to feed and to be a servant leader. You know, Peter is a person who uh, likes, has a penchant for swords. Remember he cut off the ear in the garden? Peter has been called Satan by Jesus, right? Do you remember at the Last Supper, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan? Peter has like a thing for missing the point and asking questions and not being clear. And Peter is the person who kind of has this half-cocked humanity, right? And he denies Jesus three times after saying, oh, Lord, I would never deny you. And then what happens? He turn around, turns right around. With 12, within 12 hours and denies Jesus three times before the cock crows. This is Jesus and Peter. Jesus who meets the disciples on the lakeshore, who cooks a meal, the smell of charcoal and grilled fish in the air. Mm. I always say God, that God likes a burnt meat offering for a reason, friends. Peter meets him. Naked, he swims with a blanket around him. Peter meets Jesus as a human being. Not some kind of perfect disciple. Not someone who's going to go and save the world. Here in this particular passage of Scripture, we have Peter as an example And a reminder that it is perfectly okay for us to be where we are. That even Peter, even Peter, Jesus still is in communion with. Even Peter is going to go on to tend the flock, to nurture and feed and care. Even Peter, in all his frail and fragile humanity, is going to be the rock of the church. Perfectly imperfect Peter. (laughs) And yet, Jesus calls him forward in his imperfection, in his frailness and fragileness, in his physical capacity of where he is at that moment, Jesus calls him, if you love me, if you filio me, even if you can't agape me yet, Peter, even as you filio me, even as you have deep affection for me, feed my sheep, tend to my flock, care for my lambs. 
And so why I love this passage so much, this passage of Scripture so much, is that even in our frailness and our fragileness, even in our denying of Jesus, even in the ways that we doubt and we ask stupid questions, even in the ways that we sometimes have pensions for swords and reactions and violence, even still, God calls us forward to restore us and to propel us on mission for Jesus. Amen? Even still, we are given the task to care and feed and nurture. Even still, Christ is building his church with us. Perfectly imperfect people. I don't know about you all, but that gives me hope. That Jesus can work through all of my imperfections. That Jesus can come through and work within and work in spite of me to build God's peaceable kingdom here in this life. Are we going to have doubts? Sure. Are we going to have questions? I sure hope so. But... Beloveds, in spite of all of these things, we are still called to love. Jesus is calling us into agape. Calling us into sacrificial love. That believes all and bears all and endures all that is patient and kind. Love that calls us out on a limb to follow our risen Savior. Calling us to care and attend for the whole world. To build and to be rocks on which the church is built. But friends, most importantly, I believe that in this passage that we are reminded that in this 21st century, as a people of Jesus, as Peter's, perfectly imperfect, as the church, not a building, but a people, We are the embodiment of Christ. The real realization and revealing in this world of who Jesus is. And friends, that is a heavy responsibility. Amen? The revealing of agape love and filio love and storge love and eros love. The embodiment of of hands and feet and heart and mind of Christ. We, as followers of Jesus, when we take that mantle on, are proof of a risen Savior being changed, having changed our lives. Amen? Not casting our nets in the same way we've always done it and doing the same thing we've always done, but a new creation. Christ has no hands, no feet, but ours. As St. Teresa says. First John puts it this way. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another... God's love abides in us and is perfected in us. In a day and age where so many people are looking for proof, in a day and age where so many people are hungry for longing and belonging and agape kind of love in their lives, in a day and age where perfection is held up on a social media platform. Praise God for Peters that remind us that Jesus works in and through our perfectly imperfect selves to build this kingdom. And praise God that we believe that God's Holy Spirit perfects us in our faith as we walk on this journey. Amen.
constantly being transformed and changed by the agape, unconditional, and transformational love of Christ. Amen. I invite you to join me in our Easter affirmation. And I've been listening to podcasts lately, and they're talked about living an inspired life. And I wonder, I'm curious about, are we really inspired by this gospel of good news of God's great love in Christ? Do we really believe that God's resurrection power that brought Jesus from the dead, God's love that is stronger than the grave, does it live in us? Does it abide in us? Are we agents of God out in the world? So I invite you to respond in bold. Yes, it can happen. Yes, it can take place. Yes, God can do it. The angel said, do not be afraid. The tomb was found empty. The Spirit will pray for you. God wants peace and reconciliation. God's name is justice. God liberates Yes, it can happen. Yes, it can take place. Yes, God can do it. Amen and amen and amen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia.